welcome truly appreciate you hanging out with us today considering this is the last presentation on the last day of the conference we plan to take you through our digital transformation journey from my main frame platform to our new microservice ecosystem and how we are leveraging platforms like pivotal platform and tools like kafka to make that a reality before we get into the details a quick introduction my colleague dimitri milman he is a director in software engineering and my name is ankur kaneria i am a principal architect looking at the agenda we would start out with bit about our company from there we will dive right into our legacy architecture make a case for why we need to transform and have a microservice ecosystem then we will touch base on the data sync piece that is very critical in our strategy to move away from micro, uh, mainframe to microservices we would look at the system architecture we would also look at the multi tenancy high availability scalability aspect of our data sync pipeline from there dimitri would share some of our details and experience and guidelines surrounding kafka libraries when it comes to kafka there are so many connectivity and uh, connectors and options you have spring's own framework confluent has things so uh, we will share our experiences there from there we would spend some time on performance uh, aspect how we are monitoring and one of the performance patterns where we are leveraging caching and finally we will wrap it up with what we are planning in the future and what's next on our minds <coughs> so what do express script do as a company if i can get show of hands if you know or have heard about us wow okay <laughs> that's a lot better than i expected considering we are in b2b space so we got acquired by signa which is a multi billion dollar market cap healthcare company uh, last december at the core of our business we are a pharmacy benefit manager like your medical plan administrator takes care of your medical claims we take care of your pharmacy claims in a nutshell let's say you were to go to a doctor that claim that doctor's office were to submit would be handled by your medical administrator and if doctor were to prescribe you a prescription that prescription that claim would come to us and we would adjudicate that claim we are one of the largest pharmacy benefit managers in the country and one of the largest pharmacies we serve close to 100 million people roughly every fourth american you can say so claim volume wise we do about 6 million claims a day that translates to roughly 2 billion or so scripts annually all right so what you see on the slide is what we had our legacy uh, landscape over the years we built quite a few monolithic applications what would happen is business would come to us and uh, tell us that okay we need this new uh, use case we need to deploy this product and engineering would go and uh, start building something custom for them and you you based on the experience i don't know how many of you are dealing with monoliths i'm hoping you are here because you have something like that in your current <laughs> uh backend office and you are trying to get rid of it so at a initially things would go fine you will be able to do iterative add ons and what not but there will come a time when incremental changes would start becoming not only expensive but will become complex to manage as well and that's where what you see on the right hand side is what our current state and future state comes in the picture the green boulders that you see you can think of them like microservices they have their own data 
in the mid tier they will have their own business logic and on the top there will be restful apis through which we are expo exposing that data to our consumers now what you see on the left is already in production we are bringing in new microservices in the same ecosystem and we want to start migrating consumers from left to the right if there are net new consumers you can certainly onboard them on the right side but there will be considerable time where we would need to keep our old systems and new system in a steady state sync state so that consumers can get the same consistent view of the data regardless of what platform they are fetching the data from and that's where we need a performance scalable and reliable data sync pipeline to bridge the two we won't spend too much time on this particular slide but we have it here so that you have appreciation of what our business tier stack looks like at the very bottom are our entities the microservice platforms that we are building you could have a optional business process logic tier or the interaction api and at the very top you would have your consumers trying to interact for different use cases with our uh, microservices here is a more concrete example Uh, this is one of the popular ones claims history lookup consumer is our member site so member logs into the site and at the bottom you have three microservices that kind of play a role to realize this business flow the first one is the user account authentication happens there the second one is person microservice once member has successfully logged in it is critical that we establish that holistic 360 degree view for that particular member because chances are you might have been part of different benefit plans with us over the course of several years so when you are logging in not only we want to display your claims history for the current benefit plan but if you were with us under some other benefit plans we want to give you that 360 degree view holistic picture so that person profile helps us go to the pharmacy claims microservice to get the complete 360 history there <coughs> all right so we looked at what we had we made a case for the new microservices and how the data sync platform plays a crucial role this is what the system architecture is for our data sync platform from functionality perspective on the source side we are leveraging a design pattern called cdc does everybody have idea on what cdc is about okay some so at at the core of it what change data capture gives us is ability to identify the data that we are interested in and then you can track any changes to that data in real time so that if there are downstream applications or dependencies that cares about any changes to the data they can act on it and take appropriate actions for cdc we are leveraging off the shelf product called attenuity replicate the next piece in the pipeline is kafka the cdc event stream lands on kafka and then what you see on the right hand side the pivotal platform box contains the target sync platform which is part of microservice and they would be picking up the real time data from the incoming cdc and kafka topic and cleansing it massaging it transforming it and storing it on the target service platform if we go like box by box the source systems mainly are like mainframe based attunity helps us get the data and move it on to the cdc topic from there we have the cdc stream processor that kind of picks up the data maybe on the target side your data base is no sequel like mongo or cassandra so you need to transform that relational data into a new format maybe you need to curate it you need to mix it with some other dependent sources so all that happens as part of cdc stream processor and from there the final massage data ends up on the update topic 
and you have an update service that reads that topic and makes updates to your target database. Along the way, if there are any transient errors or you need to retry, maybe your network connection is down or database is unavailable, then you have a retry topic where you can go and store any retry actions that you need to take. And then finally, last but not least, for permanent errors, there is something like error topic where you need maybe more manual follow-up. Maybe the message is corrupt and even if you were to try 1,000 times, outcome would not be different. So things like that. So that's the functional architecture of our data sync pipeline in general. Now, let's look at the same data sync pipeline, but through the lens of multi-tenancy, high availability, and scalability. Once everything is said and done, we would have close to 100 plus microservices. So whatever pattern we want to use, we want to treat it like a commodity so that as new projects get started, new microservice teams get formed, they can come to the same platform to get their needs met. So for that, we start out with what you see on the left. That's the source platform, which is mainframe. Then comes the CDC piece. As I said, we are using the Attenuity Replicate of the shelf product there followed by Kafka. CDC and Kafka gives us the near real-time streaming capability that we need. And those are hosted on commodity hardware. And finally, for our new microservices, we are leveraging Pivotal platform. What you see here as a box, that's one foundation. If you were to zoom in a little bit, within that foundation, we would have three availability zones for HA. For example, take a legacy application. Next thing, what would be happening would be the Attunity Replicate would be setting up the appropriate CDC job so that we are monitoring the tables on the legacy application to bring all the changes through CDC. On the Kafka side, you would have a topic or set of topics, Dimitri will get into details on what consideration goes in picking whether you need one topic or several. And even within topic, depending upon what the load is, you might want to consider how many partitions and things you would need. And finally, you would need appropriate number of services in your target uh, foundation. Here, uh, we have a multi-tenancy through like separate orgs, and then for a given org, you would have n number of in in instances spanning different availability zones. At a minimum, you want to make sure that for a given partition, you have a dedicated thread if you care about performance versus having a single thread in a service, kind of servicing several partitions. So there are a lot of options. Dimitri will get in detail there. Same way, if there is another microservice team inter interested in starting a new service work, they would reach out to the same leg different legacy application, CDC task gets set up, Kafka topic topics get created, and then you have a separate org with uh, separate uh, services for the um, uh, different application. Other thing that you need to care about is that your microservices probably will have different um, signatures. Some might be connection bound, some might be CPU bound. So Pivotal offers capability to sort of bind your auto scaling characteristics to like number of connections, CPU and whatnot. So that also is another factor you need to keep in mind. From uh, footprint wise, I think we have close to 20,000 containers, 200, uh, I'm sorry, 2,200 plus developers interact with our Pivotal footprint. And I think we have a team of eight to 10 operators managing the uh, footprint in general. That's pretty much it from the platform architecture perspective. Dimitri would walk us through Kafka and some of the other interesting details. Thanks, Akbar. Good afternoon, everyone. 
So as Ankur mentioned, when we started building our applications that uh, interface with Kafka, we realized that there are several options out there on the market uh, to just establish connectivity to Kafka. Uh, you have your producer-consumer APIs, your stream APIs, uh, the Kafka connector uh, ecosystem. Uh, there's also the Spring Platform um, capability. Uh, and in reality, there's no silver bullet. Each one of these approaches has their own advantages. Uh, so you want to do your own due diligence. And another thing that we realize in reality, you're going to use a combination of these things. Uh, but there are some uh, guidelines as to which uh, one is more applicable for each use case. Uh, the producer and consumers API work well for applications that directly produce data streams, such as click streams, your logs, your IoT events. Uh, on the consumer side, it's uh, where you need to have a simple consumer and perform real-time actions, such as uh, sending an event or triggering an alarm. Uh, there's also the Kafka Streams API, which is more for your typical uh, streaming platforms where you need to consume, produce uh, onto Kafka, as well as do some stateful or stateless operations, uh, such as windowing, aggregations, punctuations, et cetera. And it comes in handy for complex processing. Uh, the uh, Kafka Connect. Uh, ecosystem. Uh, there's several connectors available on Confluent Hub, and that's really geared for uh, kind of pipelines and getting data in and out of uh, data stores such as S3, MySQL, Postgre, uh, and leveraging uh, batching aspects. And there's also the Spring framework uh, with uh, Kafka, Spring Kafka, and Spring Cloud Stream uh, Kafka binders. Uh, which is really useful for your Java applications, especially if you're running Spring Boot like we are. And it gives you that abstraction of thinking uh, in terms of just the inbound channel and outbound channel, uh, and uh, also gives you ability to be somewhat platform independent or framework independent. Um, so in reality, you would use a hybrid approach uh, where we're using a lot of the Spring Cloud Stream uh, but uh, we're also relying on some of the Kafka streams uh, to do some of the more complex uh, topologies. And we're also looking to leverage Kafka Connect and KSQL, which are other options that weren't listed here. Uh, I'd like to get into some of the important aspects when designing a data uh, pipeline. Uh, and in reality, they're important for any event-driven uh, application. Um, so. By show of hands, how many of you are familiar with asset transactions in databases? All right, I was expecting that. Uh, we're, we've been working with relational databases for a while, and we know what a transaction is. Uh, so here we have a typical relational database with transactions, which could impact one or more table, two or more tables. Uh, the color coding here really represents a logical key. So this could be data pertaining to me, pertaining to Encore, or one of you. So if you look here, transaction two and transaction six uh, have the same color. And what that means, it's uh, relating to one person in our case. Uh, so typical uh, change data capture configuration is a table uh, and its changes are streamed to a single Kafka topic. And that gives a lot of efficiencies because you can then partition your topics to accommodate the load that you have on the tables. However, when you look at the topics, you see that uh, each change is treated as an isolated event. And you kind of lose that aspect of transactional boundaries or transactional order. Uh, a lot of the microservices and uh, systems that we design today are geared for eventual consistency. And if that's the approach uh, that you can achieve, uh, that's actually the ideal uh, way of uh, handling change data capture. Uh, however, uh, there are some use cases where uh, you do need that strong transactional guarantees. Uh, an example of that could be where, say, on the source side, your order processing uh, is in a relational database, and you have your order details, and you have, say, your address details. 
Uh, when you have an order place, you really don't want to treat a order uh, event and an address event as separate because even if for a slight uh, second, uh, they're out of sync, it could cause issues, uh, especially when you're dealing with pharmaceuticals and getting medication out to people. Uh, so one possible solution is to have your change data capture uh, changes go into a single topic. Uh, if, however, you can derive that common key, say data that's pertaining to me or Encore, and uh, from every event, you could still partition your topic uh, to achieve that parallelism. Uh, note that uh, you can still process uh, one transaction ahead of the other, but because you're partitioning your topics by key, the events for the same uh, logical key will always be on the same Kafka partition, and thus you're processing in uh, transactional order uh, from, from a key perspective and that should be sufficient. Uh, a most general approach uh, for transactional consistency if every event does not have that common key is to stream uh, data to a single topic and single partition, but you would see that that is essentially uh, making every, everything single-threaded. So in that case, it's good to have your uh, CDC processor be very lightweight and just determine the transactional boundaries and then repartition the stream. And then once it's repartitioned, it looks exactly like the previous use case where we can leverage the parallelism to do some of the heavier transformations and processing. Uh, this slide is just a summary uh, of the options that we discussed, so it's for uh, reference. We won't go into much details. Uh, it's important to monitor your performance of your pipeline or your microservices. Uh, given that we're using Spring Boot and the Actor module uh, and StatsD and Micrometer makes it easy for us to capture all the metrics and instrument them on something like Grafana or New Relic. Uh, when it comes to Kafka, it's also important to look at your uh, production and consumption rates and we're leveraging Confluent distribution. So Confluent Control Center uh, gives us that ability. So it's really a mixture of the two. Uh, one of the reasons why this uh, instrumentation is important is you can uh, kind of look at things in isolation. And when we did that, one of the things that uh, we noticed that could potentially be uh, sped up is with how we're um, synchronizing uh, data onto our entity. Platforms. As Ankur mentioned, this is our uh, data pipeline. Uh, but if you look at this update processor uh, and think about what it needs to do to uh, capture a new event and reflect it on the entity, uh, it essentially needs to read the current state of the entity, uh, merge the new event onto it, and write it out. Uh, in some cases, we're also interfacing with Rust APIs to get that data. So it could be a costly operation. Um, in our uh, data pipeline, there's two additional topics. Uh, one is the change topic, which also acts as an event stream for other consumers to uh, consume any changes that are happening to our entities. But there's also a latest topic, which contains uh, the most up-to-date view of the entity, and it's a compacted topic, uh, which stores all the history. So it becomes possible with uh, Kafka streams because of the uh, pretty uh, good interaction with uh, state stores, uh, typically as K tables, but you could actually provide a custom implementation of a state store and have it function just like a K table uh, and incorporate a distributed cache. Uh, this could be Pivotal Cloud Cache, which is backed by Geo. It could be Redis. Uh, Essentially, any type of cache could be incorporated into your uh, streaming topology. And what that allows us to do is to synchronize that cache with the latest topic and then have the update processor talk to the cache and merge uh, events into the cache. Uh, we saw some uh, pretty significant performing gains, uh, performance gains by uh, going that route. And then what that also allows you to do is to leverage your latest topic as a right-behind cache and 
efficiently synchronize that back to the database with something like Kafka Connect that we discussed earlier. Uh, so this is an example where you're really leveraging several uh, options that are available to you. You have your uh, Spring uh, Kafka integration, your Kafka Stream state stores, and Kafka Connect in one pipeline. So where do we go from here? Uh, we kind of uh, provided you an overview of our uh, data pipeline and our uh, long-term goal. Uh, with uh, Kafka in place and uh, the Pivotal platform uh, in place, we also stood up a data lake, uh, which is capturing data from uh, the latest topics. And it becomes uh, really useful because you no longer need to write these uh, expensive uh, ingestion processes. Everything is uh, streamlined and event-based. And we're working on uh, adding uh, machine learning algorithms to provide benefits to our consumers, our customers, and improve the pharmacy practice uh, in general. Um, we're building more entities and microservices that uh, use a event, uh, kind of commoditizing on the event-driven architecture. Um, this allows us to replace uh, a lot of the batch processes with uh, real-time processing and analytics and helping out uh, the patient and uh, practice. We're evangelizing the entity first approach. So a lot of uh, use cases that we're getting into right now is when we try to add capability, we do that on the entity platform. Uh, but as Ankur was mentioning, that also requires some of the synchronization back into uh, mainframes or um, not everything, but just the relevant data to keep uh, some of that processing functioning in a hybrid state. So uh, with that, that's kind of where we're heading. Uh, we see firsthand how uh, cloud computing, the Pivotal Platform, Kafka, change data capture, uh, allows us to innovate, experiment, most importantly, try things out, fail fast, uh, and find new and uh, immediate ways of accessing data. And uh, improving uh, the safety and the experience of our customers and clients. So with that, thank you for listening to our digitization journey. Uh, there's plenty more to come. Uh, a lot of you know Express Script, it seems, and we're hiring. <laughs> so <laughs> we have a location in Austin, uh, in St. Louis, in the uh, tri-state area. So we'll look at the career page, and uh, we'll open it up to your questions. Sure, so uh, our change data capture is done by a third party product uh, called Attunity. Uh, so that's the piece that, uh, it actually runs on Linux, but it reads the transaction log from we're doing, dealing with mainframe DB2, but we also have implementations of Oracle, so it can, works with multiple database vendors. And that is kind of the technology that streams it to Kafka. Uh, in there, this is where that configuration takes place as to one topic, multiple topics, uh, whether you sort of partition by the database table's primary key, et cetera. Uh, but those are kind of the, um, uh, what I described with the various options for partitioning on Kafka, those are the considerations that would go into how you set up the CDC. But, in general, it's the Attunity product. Uh, there are other um, vendors uh, that do that as well. Yes. Right, so if they're uh, done as one transaction on the source, and an example could be, like, let's say I have preferred addresses 
but when I'm placing an order, I could either use one of my preferred address or actually have a temporary address which gets set up. So that's a use case where on the source you can have two uh, writes as a single transaction. And if you leverage the partitioning of where uh, your data is streamed to a single topic, then uh, the CDC product, Attunity, it uh, has the concept of a transactional boundary and transaction ID. So that uh, CDC processor would have the smarts of kind of going through the events and knowing whether they're from the same transaction or not and group them together. But if it's a uh, existing address that hasn't been changed and is just a reference, then you'll only get uh, a order uh, information on there, uh, which uh, from uh, re referential data, you can pull the address and you don't need to worry about it. Correct. If that's your requirement, yes. Update processor or CDC stream processor, you can incorporate the logic to make sure the target microservice has what it needs. Yeah. And, and those are cases where caching comes in really important because a lot of cases, it's a, like, say, in a order processing perspective. It's something that gets continuously worked up and evolving, but it's still relatively a short-lived thing. So something like a LRU cache uh, is good because you're, you, you uh, improve your performance. Yeah, uh, do you wanna answer? Yeah, so that's the, that's the tricky one a little bit. So th there are a few approaches we are kind of contemplating with. Either you create, kind of start out with kind of a skeleton record on the microservice side, because on the microservice world, we are assigning something called resource IDs to each and every record. And then you still leverage what you had on the legacy side to do your write, let that data flow through the data sync pipeline. And then when that legacy view shows up, you kind of do upsert and merge it with what you had started with. Because if you are servicing writes on the microservice side, you need to take care of your consumers. <laughs> So you need to give them a context so that later if they want to come back for updates and things like that, they have that. So that's the challenging part. <laughs> yeah. But in terms of getting the actual data into the source databases, a lot of it is uh, kind of services on the back end that uh, interact with it. I mean, we, we've thought of writing some generic process similar to Attunity and kind of have it as customizable. Uh, but people that own the legacy applications are trying to be protective of how the database is accessed. Guy in the back. Good question. So, what we shared, this is our internal ecosystem. We do have certain defined patterns how we exchange data with our external consumers. There are B2B gateways to exchange data either in file format. A Lot of these entities, a lot of these microservices, the way they are getting built, we want to become API first company. So eventually our long-term vision is that the consumers that may be leveraging either file exchange or the older SOAP or other interfaces, we want them to be start using our API first. It's like eating our own dog food kind of thing. Whatever we use internally, we want our external consumer to be using also the same thing. But that will take some time. <laughs> Right, so I mean, we have uh, UAT, QA. Time is off, so we can take it offline. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I think we got the time off thing. We can catch up offline.
Thanks, everyone. Okay.